Uh, I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, I've been here for almost 10 years now. Um, my upstream uh, open source project right now, or, or uh, community right now, is called Apicurio. And I have an Apicurio t-shirt, and I forgot to put it on. So we'll have to deal with this Quarkus one for now. But um, in the Apicurio upstream space, we have a few different projects. Um, we pro probably, I'm guessing, they'll come up a little bit in, in the uh, answers to some of these questions. But um, primarily, we have uh, something called Apicurio Studio, which is a API design tool. And we have something called Apicurio Registry, which is a, um, a service registry, a, a schema and API design registry. So uh, I do a lot of I do a lot of coding all day long and um, and work with a team of other engineers in the application services space, as as Hugo says. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. Just a quick question. Uh, were you planning to present something in the screen or should I go directly to the questions? Straight to questions. I think we're just going to use the force of our personalities to project, uh, you know, instead of instead of screens. That will do it. Great. All right. So, um, yeah. So, well, um, in this context of uh, digital transformation in, in, in the practically all economy sectors, it is important to keep learning about data and APIs management. I mean, that is a must, and we need to understand how the context is evolving in order to take the right decisions, right, for a company. So my first question, and, and you decide who wants to, to answer each question, it would be regarding implementation. So given that teams still find late issues during the implementation by the consumers, what is the best approach to review API proposals? So who, who wants to go first? No, I got it. Um, so that's a, that's a great question. I think, um, and I, for me, it's uh, it's not a simple question necessarily. But I would say a big uh, a factor here, in my experience, is contract first development from an API perspective, right? So when you're creating APIs, I think um, there's still a lot of teams out there that are doing implementation first, and it makes everything so much more difficult. Uh, over the life cycle of the API. And so one of the things that, at Red Hat that we try to encourage uh, through you know, our, our advocacy, but also our you know, technology is to try and encourage contract first development. What that allows you to do is, um, is to find issues and to get buy-in from stakeholders um, earlier in the process, right? So instead of, instead of uh, creating an API implementation, getting it you know, written and built and deployed, and then getting feedback from potential uh, consumers of that API, which is so far late in the game, and then have to come back and take any sort of um, feedback you might get from those from those stakeholders and fold that back into your development cycle and just produce another, another build. Instead, uh, with contract-first development, you can start to design your APIs up front using you know, tooling and, and things like this to, uh, and to, to you know, coordinate and, and collaborate with the other stakeholders, testers, and and API consumers and whatnot uh, to, to uh, arrive at a an API that solves everybody's problems or meets everybody's business needs earlier on in the life cycle, right? So we can iterate on that. And what that allows you to do is to do things like generate mock servers, uh, generate client SDKs, um, actually get realistic feedback and realistic use cases from your consumers. Um, so the mock the mock servers, if you can provide good mock data, um, you know we have excellent tooling these days for doing these kinds of things. This allows us to have that sort of early um, like lifecycle feedback and not have to wait until development. Um, we've definitely seen great success great successes doing this, where you know a really solid API contract can be created before a single line of of server implementation code is even written. Um, and it just makes for you know an overall smoother process. So you you work out a lot of those kinks and, and you find a lot of the, a lot of those issues that you mentioned uh, long before they get to they get to you know uh, customers and, and things like this. Um, so overall, it just makes for a, you know for a better life cycle, better story, and a smoother development process. Excellent. Thank you. I don't know, Hugo. Do you want to to complement? Yeah. I'm, I just want to complement what Eric was saying. Um, it is important to have the uh, clear definition that um, even though APIs most of the times are be, are being confused with the implementation side, the, so the the uh, uh, the I 
most of the times people think, oh, I'm delivering a, a jar file, this is my API. Really the, the I from API comes from the interface. So the interface needs to also be managed as an uh, first class uh, artifact and needs to be uh, having its own life cycle. And that's why uh, doing contract first uh, development, it's, it's so important because it allows you to um, easily communicate and collaborate within the uh, uh, the scope of the uh, of the interface of the contract, and then that's how you can uh, easily move forward with the different proposals on on this uh, on this contract. And then the implementation can come after that, either as a mock or either as a real implementation for the API. Excellent, thank you, Hugh. So um, the next question would be: How do you see? the API lifecycle automation with API ops? I think I'll take a swing at that one again. Um, so API ops, I think, is a relatively new thing that's that's um, building on top of existing you know, DevOps and, and more importantly, perhaps from a practical standpoint, GitOps approaches to, to development. Um, and so I think as a result, you get a lot of, you know, you get all the great stuff, you inherit all the great stuff that um, GitOps gives you around like, you know, uh, governance, traceability, you get that sort of really nice declarative configuration, right? A single place where, uh, where you can go to see what your deployments look like and this kind of thing. And so for so what API ops, in my view anyway, it does is it is it adds on to that or builds onto those concepts, um, API specific uh, checks for lack of a better term, right? So we have all the things that you might want to do uh, to validate and uh, to do sort of validation and linting of your APIs um, and to do API testing, perhaps integration testing, all these sorts of, of things that you can do upfront um, to, in, to ensure that the APIs that have been created really do conform to the standards that you have and, and you know, you can be confident that they're correct and, and uh, complete. Um, again, this this does this does sort of assume, I think, that you're using a contract first approach, because the power of having the the description of your API up front unlocks a lot of this capability, right? So so whatever typically we, we you know we see open API and, and async API for, for API as as specifications that people are using for designing. It doesn't have to be those technologies, but those are very common. Um, you know, couple that with the the sort of schema formats that people really like, whether it's protobuf or JSON schema or Avro, and you have you know sort of much more formalized um, contracts and descriptions of of the API that you're trying to to do, and so you can incorporate the um, you know these kinds of, of validity and and linting checks as part of the automation that goes into your your GitOps or your, your API ops approach. Um, what does that get you, right? It gets you a, a quicker turnaround and, uh, whenever you make changes to your API, uh, to your contracts. It gets you a higher quality uh, because you can be confident that you're you're conforming to standards. It gets you fast, repeatable you know, deployments and allows you to more easily evolve your APIs over time. So, um, so yeah, that, that would be my take on, on API apps, I think. Great. Thank you. Hugo? Um, I think it's uh, it is it's really important on 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 the upside, right? That there is the trend that we are seeing that we'll certainly um, get a lot from managing these artifacts in, in their own life cycle as part of uh, what Eric was mentioning regarding um, pipelines and delivery. Those will be certainly uh, the, the next steps when you are able to get this uh, contract first approach. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, why do large development teams struggle so much to deliver an API, let alone an API of high quality? That noise. Can you hear me? Yes, getting some feedback. Hugo, I think it's on your end. We can't hear you. Ah, fading away. 
Yeah. All right. I'll take I'll take it I'll take it again. While while Hugo fi figures out his uh his technical difficulties, we'll we'll try we'll try and answer. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of uh you know sort of the similar kinds of things um uh, that we've talked a little bit about already, but but I'll go into a little bit more depth. So why do large development teams struggle to deliver APIs, right? Um, and it's I think it's it's the same reason they they struggle to deliver any software, right? Like the more people you have, the more difficult it is to coordinate and to and to produce um, complex software. Um, and so, but but specifically for delivering APIs, um, what I would say to this is process is adding process. And and I say that by the way as a person who hates process, right? So like, don't think that I'm coming at this from a perspective of like being a, you know, Six Sigma black belt for project management or something. Like I do not like process. I'm a, I am at heart an open source developer. My projects tend to be small and, um, you know, relatively small development teams. And, you know, we rely a lot on community and things like this. We don't generally have a lot of process, but so, so that's where I'm coming from, right? That said, for larger development teams, in order for them to create like really good APIs, I think process can actually really help, right? Um, and so by, and what do I mean by process? Some of the stuff we've already talked about, API ops, right? Uh, the ability to do validation and linting of the APIs, doing contract first development so that you have a strong description and contract of your APIs and your schemas um, so that you can get um, you know, early buy-in from stakeholders and, and those sorts of things. Um, you get to do, so, you know, you get the benefits of um, the mocking server, like I, like I said earlier, you get the benefit of uh, early integration testing with, with other stakeholders, other consumers, um, you know, early feedback from those same consumers. Um, and so you can more effectively evolve your API over time, but you can't do that with large numbers of people effectively. Um, as everybody I'm sure has experienced, or many people have experienced. And, but that process that, that, and, and more specifically than process automation of process, right? The ability to, uh, to automate these checks, ensuring high quality, high standards of the contract and, and things like this allows you to make sure that all of these disparate employees or, or contributors to the, to the, um, to the API are doing it in a way that's consistent with a high quality output. Um, and so in this perhaps rare instance, I actually think um, a process really can help, help especially, or, or maybe even exclusively when a, a high uh, level of, of automation is applied to it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Hugo, uh, um, can we check if, you, if we can hear you? <laughs> can you say hi? No, we still can't hear you. Uh-oh. All right. I think he's faking no. that. I think he's faking this, so I have to answer all the questions. <laughs> he was not prepared. <laughs> no, of course. Um, okay, so so we will go on with you, Eric. Um, this question is: uh, What do you recommend to API developers to secure themselves and their clients from third-party risk? What would you say? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think there's a couple of aspects to third-party risk that we probably have to consider, uh, maybe at least sort of two sides of it, right? There's the there's the security of the API itself, um, where at, you know in, included in the design of the API the, the, or the description of the API, the comp part of the contract would be the you know what security is required what's being used so that could just be a definition of the the, the security requirements oauth uh basic authentication um you know um uh, mutual TL uh, mutual tls perhaps you know whatever that might be hugo go ahead and interrupt and say hi hi yeah you got it excellent um, hey we're talking yeah, about sorry about that somehow my some something hijacked my cpu and yeah, Absolutely. don't worry, don't worry. That uh, we are used to these kind of breaks in in this virtual uh, session. Don't worry. Never buy one. Of, never buy an engineer, though. Presumably, right? No, I'm kidding. Um, no, Hugo. <laughs> we're we're just talking about um, how do we recommend API developers secure themselves and their clients, uh, right? That was it from from, from risk. risk. Yeah, from, from risk. third party yeah. risk, right? Mm -hmm. So I was just starting with a, a 
saying that there are sort of two aspects to it. One is the security of the API itself, right? Around like defining the the, um, the security uh, requirements of the of the API and things like this. Um, and then uh, I think for me the other aspect of it is the 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 overall supply chain, supply right? Chain. The dependency supply chain. So I think there's a big push uh, these days around how do we secure all of the dependencies that we have in our project, right? Um, this is actually an area that, that Red Hat is working on right now, which is to figure out a, a, like a build system that our customers can use to confidently create, like create implementations of their APIs where they're pulling in third party dependencies oftentimes, especially for Red Hat, for um, you know, open source dependencies, right? We have all of these dependencies. Can we create a build system that analyzes those dependencies for security risks, for CDEs, and then can where we can confidently apply fixes to CVEs even when like the third party repository is compromised, for example. So um, these are the challenges that we're working on. Mariana, I've lost. Okay, I'm now. going to I'm going to mute so so you can you don't hear that echo. Okay, cool. Um, Hugo, I think, do you, do you have anything to add to, to that? I think, yeah, you don't want to um, yeah, so it is, um, it, it's like, uh, as I was saying before, it's two ways, right? The, the one thing is secure the uh, build of the API implementation through uh, secure pipelines, and, and when you can check dependencies and uh, be sure that the, all the build of materials for your API are secure and they're coming for trusted sources. And then there's another way that it's super important, as we, you were mentioning at the beginning, uh, API management, it's the, the best way to secure APIs, right? You can design your API and you can implement the your contract to be uh, to enforce, you know, certain type of authentication, certain um, characteristics and the paths and the, and the data payloads that you're sharing. But... Um, the, the rest of the things like policies um, are better handled by things like an API manager that allows you to implement things like, uh, you know, rate limiting, um, control uh, access control through keys or through um, more secure three-legged authentication like the OpenID Connect or OAuth flows. So um, those are, are um, certainly um, ways or, uh, or different um, um, solutions that that help you to secure uh, your APIs and avoid um, the most common type of attacks, and uh, and they will certainly minimize the the surface. Right, handling the same implementation for internal teams as well as to external teams uh, means that you will certainly need to um, to secure those endpoints in the different ways, and uh, perhaps um, uh, filtering and perhaps just exposing certain parts of your API. To, to consumers or to external uh, uh, third-party um, uh, applications and, and, and users. So that's how we see that uh, we can secure APIs in both in both lanes, right? Um, the implementation as well as the contract or the endpoint that is that is accessing. Yeah, you know what? I, let me just build on that a little bit, Hugo, because something you said there really reminded me of of something that I read recently about information security and, and security even outside of you know our IT world but that security we should often look at security as not just you know what is the solution to security what is the one thing we can do to secure our APIs or, or whatever we're trying to secure um, security oftentimes is, is layered right or, or not often should be layered uh, it's called it, it's a lot of times in various industries called the the Swiss cheese approach to um, to security and so like every layer imagine every imagine every layer as a slice of Swiss cheese it will block some things, but it will allow some things through, right? So it's designed, that layer is designed to mitigate certain risk. And then you add another layer on it, which is another slice of Swiss cheese and has different holes. And so it blocks other things, but lets other things through. So you put enough layers of Swiss cheese and you're blocking all of the, the approaches or the, all of the you know, attack vectors, for example, for your, uh, for your software. So you know, as Hugo has said, We've got API management where you're where you're doing rate limiting and and other forms of security, but then you also have the supply chain and you have so you've got maybe four or five six eight layers. You build all that together and you have a strong and secure um, uh, API. Yeah, 
Excellent. You let me know if you still hear the echo, please. So uh, moving to the next question. So are there different guidelines on design for EDA compared with REST APIs? I think that would go for it. Right? Yeah, uh, that's, well, that's uh, very interesting. What, what were you were saying, Mariana, you, you were adding something? No, 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 no. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I was I was saying there are a lot of uh, sometimes um, understandings of what an API is, and as well as I was saying, most, some people you know associate API with just the implementation details. There's uh, also a, a group of people that um, when when you say API, the thing that comes first to, to our mind is uh, it's REST HTTP APIs, right? However, as I was saying, uh, we see at least from 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 our team we have seen. Uh, really application connectivity overall as, as APIs and then how to interact between applications now with all these distributed systems being deployed across the hybrid cloud and such. So what it means is that, yeah, even though we do have focus, we have been focusing on uh, REST HTTP uh, calls and, and the HTTP protocol, uh, we see that there are other type of, um, you know, communication patterns that allows us to, you know, bring this application connectivity. And one of those, it's uh, obviously uh, event-driven architecture or EDA, where you have a, a message broker or an event bus that needs to be able to connect, uh, that is used to connect applications and, and such. So for that, they you, they also offer you a, you know, an endpoint where you need to connect and they have certain semantics for the activities that you can do and the certain type of data that you will be able to send and receive uh, depending on, on, on if you're a consumer or producer. So even though it might look different and because it's a different protocol, um, what we have seen from the, um, uh, from the contract perspective is that you can use um, similar approaches for um, uh, REST APIs through things like OpenAPI as well as for EDA through uh, REST, uh, sorry, for um, from a sync API. So you can uh, still be able to model your EDA endpoints or points of contact or APIs as, as we call them asynchronous APIs or uh, streaming APIs or even driven APIs. And then you can still get all the benefits for the maturity of the, uh, of the REST APIs to also be applied for, for the EDA. So you can still, you, you still do have a specification, you still do have security patterns, you still do have um, SDK generators, you still have the opportunity to socialize your APIs and being able to get all the benefits of this decoupling between teams, being able to share them, even go all the way, as Eric was mentioning, to uh, be able to mock and test those contracts. So I, I do think that the guidelines can be the same. They can be shared across that. Um, so in this case, you have a, a, a streamlined um, connectivity for your applications. Great. I actually, let me just add yeah. on to that one. I know we're probably yeah. running out of time. That always happens with me. Uh, but one thing I would like to add there too is it's 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 not necessarily just either or too. Like, oh, we have, uh, we have synchronous and we have asynchronous um, architectures and they don't mix, right? Many times uh, people have mixed architectures where they have a little bit of both. One of the nice things about doing, about creating contracts is you can, and it's very um, useful to do this, you can you can define your business um, entities separately from your actual APIs. So you have a set of schemas, for example, that define what is an invoice, what is a customer, what is a person within your, you know, your business use case. And then when you have asynchronous um, um, uh, APIs, you can define those with something like async API and you can reference those shared data types, those shared entities, but you can also have synchronous APIs elsewhere in your organization that deal with the same kinds of data. And then you can you can reference those same entities from open API. This is an area I think that's um, underutilized within the industry at the moment and something that we're trying to, I think, work, work on a little bit more at Red Hat. Excellent, Eric, thank you. So uh, unfortunately the time is up and uh, and I have a, a, a huge list that, it, that, that will 
will remain for me uh, unanswered, but uh, our our audience can can go to the Red Hat booth and keep engaging with you guys and, and solving questions. And um, thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, and uh, thank, thank you to the audience for, um, for, for, for being here joining us. And I really hope you, you keep enjoying this fantastic event with a lot of information and a lot of knowledge, a lot to learn about this, this evolution of APIs. And uh, well, see you until the next time. Thank you guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you, it was Thank a pleasure. You. Jerry knows the booth and we can answer all the questions there. We will be for time. Yeah, please go, please do.